Spelljammer Academy. Behold Hakatha. Introduction. This adventure, designed for 3 to 7 4th level characters, is the last in a series of 4 adventures. The adventures take place in Realm Space, a wild space system described in the series' third installment, Spelljammer Academy, Realm Space Sortie. Background. Tasked with retrieving a meteorite from the planet Hakatha, the characters and their fellow Spelljammer Academy cadets boarded a derelict tyrant ship, a stone vessel built by beholders. After installing a Spelljammer helm aboard the ship, the characters ran into some trouble. A fire aboard the tyrant ship killed the character's supervisor, Petty Officer Ryback. An investigation revealed Cadet Micken Haverstance to be the saboteur. After his capture and interrogation, Micken told the characters that he'd been hired by a Mercane, a blue-skinned giant, who holds a grudge against one of the Spelljammer Academy's founders, Mert the Merciless. The Mercane's name is Vokath, though neither Micken nor the characters are aware of this fact. Overview Despite setbacks, the characters are authorized to resume their mission to Hakatha. The skies above Hakatha are patrolled by Beholder Tyrant ships. The character's goal is straightforward. Slip past the planet's defenses, find the meteorite, and bring it back to the Spelljammer Academy. This adventure is split into three parts. Part 1 the spindle. While exploring the spindle, a mountain that rises from the center of the dish-shaped world Hakatha, the characters encounter beholder-like creatures and might have to fight them to claim the meteorite. Part 2. Journey Interrupted. As the characters travel back to Toril, they cross paths with an asteroid and run into a Githyanki agent of Vakath, looking to retrieve Mikan. Part 3. Homecoming. The characters return to the Spelljammer Academy, and soon after arrival, face a strike force sent by Vokath. Their graduation is tinged with loss, and an ominous future awaits. Adventure Hooks This adventure picks up where Spelljammer Academy, Realm Space Sortie, leaves off. If one or more characters died in that adventure, assume their replacements are fresh cadets from the Hammerhead ship, Flighty Foundling. The characters have a rendezvous with the flighty floundling before resuming their voyage to Hakatha as described in part 1. Part 1. The Spindle In this part of the adventure, the characters arrive at the planet Hakatha and search for the adamantine meteorite at the base of a soaring mountain called the Spindle. In a cave they encounter others who appreciate the meteorite's value. Trek to Hakatha after securing the tyrant ship and capturing the cadet saboteur, Mikan, the characters wait for the hammerhead ship, Flighty Foundling, to double back and take Mikan into custody. Two Spelljammer Academy faculty members are aboard the Flighty Foundling, Bosun Tato and Sayeth Abazine. They have decided to accompany the characters to Hakatha to ensure no further mishaps occur aboard the tyrant ship. Sayeth assumes the role of captain and spelljammer, while Tato takes the characters under her wing and oversees the mission. Wizpop, the autonome stowaway whom the characters encountered in the previous adventure, boards the flighty foundling and returns to Spelljammer Academy with Cricklit, Fred, and other cadets. The flighty foundling returns to Toril with the other cadets and the autonome Wizpop, but your destiny lies elsewhere. You must remain aboard the tyrant ship, but you won't be travelling to Hakatha by yourselves. Faculty members Sayeth Abazine and Bosan Tato have taken command of the mission and brought more supplies with them. Tato grimaces and gnaws her cigar as she assigns you to dull tasks. Meanwhile, Sayeth takes control of the tyrant ship's newly installed spell jamming helm. The trek to Hakatha takes many days, and the planet's description doesn't do it justice. Hakatha is a watery disk thousands of miles wide, with a towering mountain called the Spindle at its center. Sayeth maneuvers the tyrant ship so that it hovers a few feet above the surface of the water at the Spindle's edge. Bosun Tato flicks away the stub of her smoldering cigar as she orders you to unfurl a rope ladder. 
Here's the deal, see. You have one sending stone, and I have the other. When you find the meteorite, contact me and let me know, then await further instructions. Tato tosses you a satchel. There's a bag of holding. You can use it to contain the meteorite. The impact site is nearby. If the meteorite isn't there, search the nearby caves. Seath and I will stay and guard the ship. Keep track of who has the other sending stone and the bag of holding. Once the characters climb down the rope ladder and exit the tyrant ship, they can see the surroundings more clearly. They are standing on the rocky shore of the spindle, a mountain bigger than any they've seen before. The sun is a distant speck, and daylight on Hakatha is no brighter than a starry night on Toril. Hakatha Features Hakatha has the following features. Dimensions and Terrain Hakatha is a dish-shaped water world, with a single large mountain called the Spindle jutting from its centre. The disc tapers at the edge to form a rim. The Spindle is 200 miles across at its base, and tapers to a peak a thousand miles above sea level. Light. The shores of the Spindle are dimly lit. The distant sun provides little warmth or illumination. Shore of the Spindle. Rocky ground, worn smooth by eons of gentle waves, extend about 500 feet from the water's edge to the spindle's sheer cliffs. Standing on the shore, characters could see numerous caves in the spindle's base. Sounds. Nothing stirs in the shallow water. In the distance, seabirds call to each other, swooping and diving for food in the deeper waters. Finding the meteorite. Characters who search the shore for the meteorite don't find it, but it doesn't take them long to find where the meteorite crashed. In the dim light of the distant sun, you see a blemish on the face of the spindle, where something must have struck at great speed, shattering the rock and leaving a huge indentation. Whatever struck the mountainside tumbled down towards the shore, leaving a furrow of melted rock. Characters can easily ascertain where the meteorite came to rest after tumbling down the mountainside. However, the meteorite is nowhere to be seen. Characters who search the area find a single set of tracks leading from the place where the meteorites came to rest at a 15 foot wide, 20 foot high cave mouth at the base of the spindle about 250 feet away. Any character who examines the tracks and succeeds on a DC-10 wisdom survival check identify them as belonging to a large giant of some kind, possibly an ogre. Spindle Cavern If the characters follow the tracks into the cave, describe the following. The 15-foot wide passage opens into a large rough chamber with a sunken floor. A misshapen, vaguely oblong lump of metal sits in the middle of the chamber. A sliver of light streaming down on it from a hole in the cavern ceiling gives it a dark blue sheen. Hovering near the meteorite are two identical creatures, each one a slimy green orb with a large central eye and four writhing eye stalks. Gathered around them are half a dozen smaller creatures of similar shape, each no bigger than a grapefruit. Sitting on a five foot high shelf overlooking the chamber, is a massive yellow-skinned ogre with one cyclopean eye. The ogre yawns and blinks slowly, appearing rather tired. The cavern is depicted in the Spindle Cavern map. The characters arrive via the northwest tunnel, which ends at a five-foot-high ledge overlooking the cavern. Cavern Features The cavern has the following features. Exits The cavern has multiple exits that lead deeper into the vast network of tunnels and caves that riddle the spindle. Light. The cavern is dimly lit by precious little sunlight that streams through the cracks in the ceiling. Meteorite. The meteorite looks like it was dropped in the middle of the floor. The 500 pound hunk of blackened metal takes on a dark blue sheen when its surface is illuminated. The meteorite is 2 feet long, 18 inches wide, and 18 inches tall. It can fit inside the character's bag of holding. Creatures. Two spectators and six gazers gather around the meteorite. The spectators can't decide which of them should guard the meteorite, and they are anxious for someone to help resolve their dispute. The gazers were drawn into the cave by the spectators' argument, but lack the intelligence to be of assistance. 
The Psychopsian Ogre is a simple-minded brute who found the meteorite and brought it here. The Ogre serves a powerful beholder named Kazot, who fortunately lives much deeper in the mountain and doesn't appear in this adventure. It doesn't take the beholder kin long to realize that the intruders have arrived. After a brief telepathic conference, the spectators use their telepathy to jointly reach out to the characters. An alien voice in your head says, Mysterious outsiders, I am Spectator Grilob. This is Spectator Olob. Each of us claims the right to guard this strange meteorite, but only one of us may do so. A similar, yet differently telepathic voice adds, We call upon you to mediate our dispute at once. By asking appropriate questions, characters can learn the following information. Grilob and Ulob feel compelled to guard the meteorite because it seems like a worthwhile treasure to protect. However, neither spectator tolerates the other's help. They each want the sole guardianship of the meteorite. Neither Grilob nor Orlob were told to guard the meteorite. The cavern is a Cyclopean ogre's lair. The spectators just happened by after hearing the ogre drop the meteorite on the floor. Grilob arrived first, followed by Orlob and the gazers. The spectators want the characters to choose a guardian for the meteorite, but simply making a choice isn't enough to satisfy either spectator. The character's proposal must include a reasonable explanation the explanation can be as simple as Grelob arrived first, so Grelob should guard the meteorite. Alternatively, the characters can claim that neither spectator should guard the meteorite since it clearly belongs to the ogre or that the ogre should choose the guardian. Whichever character makes the proposal must then make a DC-13 Charisma Persuasion check. If one or more characters succeeds on the check, the spectators settle their dispute in a way that the characters suggest. If no character succeeds on the check, the spectators refuse to accept the character's proposal, although characters can make a different one. If one spectator ends up guarding the meteorite, the other spectator takes the gazers and leaves via one of the other tunnels, disappearing into the mountain's depths. The ogre stays behind. If the ogre ends up as the meteorite's guardian, both spectators leave and take the gazers with them. The ogre, who is very tired, falls asleep shortly thereafter, allowing the characters to take the meteorite without any fuss. Combat erupts. The spectators won't allow the characters to claim the meteorite under their watch. If combat erupts, the spectators defend the meteorite, the gazers scatter and flee in terror, and the Cyclopsian ogre wearily defends itself and its lair. Back to the ship. Once they've bagged the meteorite, the characters can use their sending stone to contact Bosan Tato, or they can simply head back to the tyrant ship. If they use the stone, Tato replies as follows. Get back to the ship. This planet gives me the creeps. The characters have no encounter on their way back to the tyrant ship. Once they climb the rope ladder and get back on board, Bosan Tato takes back the character's sending stone, as well as the bag of holding. With Sayerth at the spell jamming helm, the tyrant ship flies away from Hagartha, slipping past other tyrant ships on patrol. Sayerth then sets a course for Toril. Lighting a cigar, Bosun Tato tells the characters, Now comes the easy part. Part 2. Journey Interrupted In this part of the adventure, the characters must deal with Quitru, a Gith Yankee working for the Mercane Verkath. Quitru's mission is to retrieve Mikan, the traitorous cadet. The Githyanki doesn't know Mikan is no longer aboard the tyrant ship, so negotiations could get interesting. Asteroid ahead. The character's tyrant ship encounters an asteroid a few days travel from Hakatha. Proximity to the asteroid causes the ship to reduce speed. Describe the following. It has been a few uneventful days, except for the revelation that Sayerth is an excellent dragon chess player. Tato continues your training to keep your edge and stave off boredom. You've now memorized each card in the Wild Space Creature Silhouette deck she has brought along. You're gathered on the command deck at mealtime when Sayerth says, Feels like an asteroid coming up on us. As the ship slows down, Sayerth remarks, 
I'm sure I'm right, but go get a visual to confirm. Tato hands you back the sending stone. Just in case. Now go stretch them legs. The characters need to head down to the hollow deck of the tyrant ship to get a good view of what slowed them down. As they climb down the rope ladders, they pass through the tyrant ship's gravity plane before getting a good vantage point at the edge of one of the large openings on the deck. From this vantage point, they see the following. A rocky debris field floats outside of your ship's air envelope. About half a mile away, a pockmark asteroid rotates slowly. The asteroid is at least three times larger than your vessel. Attempting to hide behind the asteroid is a damselfly ship crewed by Githyanki. Characters who succeed on a DC-18 wisdom perception check can see a brief glint suggestive of a metallic vessel moments before it disappears behind the asteroid. If the characters send a message back to Tato, she has a hunch that the hidden ship is a pirate vessel, since pirates are known to haunt this region of wild space. Kitru's arrival. Describe the following. You see a strange distortion in space moments before a winged shark-like creature appears in front of you. It has blue skin, four wings, and a horn-like protrusion on its head. An armored figure rides on its back. The rider says, Hail to you. I've come to retrieve something that is of interest to my employer. Please produce the human named Mika Havenstance, and all will be well. Kutru, a Gith Yankee warrior, rides a Star Lancer. The Star Lancer used Invisibility Cloak to approach the tyrant ship unseen. Kutru is the first officer aboard the Damselfly ship lurking behind the asteroid. The Damselfly is one of several ships dispatched throughout realm space to intercept the characters and retrieve Mikan. Kutru and her Githyanki shipmates were told that Mikan is traveling aboard a tyrant ship with several other cadets. Kutru's ship was positioned in the right place at the right time to intercept the tyrant ship on its way from Hakatha to Toril. Kutru doesn't know the tyrant ship's combat capabilities so she's not willing to risk her entire crew to retrieve Mikan. If the characters tell Kutru that Mikan is not aboard the tyrant ship, Kutru assumes that they are lying to protect Mikan. She asks, Why do you risk your life to protect a traitor? She then demands that they produce Mikan at once. If the characters refuse or reassert the fact that Mikan is not aboard, Kutru and the Star Lancer attack, spoiling for a fight. If combat ensues, Kutru and the Star Lancer close to melee range. When Kutru or the Star Lancer has fewer than 20 hit points remaining, Kutru orders the Star Lancer to retreat. On its next turn, the Star Lancer uses Invisibility Cloak and flies back towards the asteroid. If the Star Lancer dies before it can escape, Kutru casts Misty Step on her next turn, teleports next to a character, and attacks with her greatsword. If a character uses the Sending Stone to request help from Boswain Tato, she says, I'll be right there, and heads to the hollow deck. Tato is armed with a musket with a plus 7 to hit that deals 1d12 plus 3 piercing damage on a hit. Capturing Quitru. If Quitru is captured, the characters can interrogate her. Under interrogation, she reveals the following information. Quitru and her crew work for a McCain named Vokath. Vokath has several vessels looking for the tyrant ship. The damselfly ship hiding behind the asteroid has four Jif and four Githyanki aboard it. Strange Sigil Characters who search Kutru or observe her closely notice a strange sigil tattooed on the back of her right hand. A detect magic spell reveals an aura of transmutation magic around the tattoo. The tattoo is Vokath's sigil, worn by those who are closest to the Mercain. Onward Sayerth guides the tyrant ship out of the debris field and continues towards Toril. The ship picks up speed once it gets a mile away from the asteroid. Sayerth's priority is to get back to Toril and make sure Spelljammer Academy knows Vokath has operations searching for Mikan. Hopefully, we'll get to him before they do, Sayerth remarks. Damselfly Ship 
The Damselfly ship has a crew of four Jif shipmates and four Githyanki warriors, not including Quatru. As the tyrant ship moves away from the asteroid, the Damselfly's canny Jif captain, Mustaf Schultz, instructs the ship's spelljammer, a Githyanki named Nalvor, to follow the tyrant ship to Toril while keeping a safe distance. The characters encounter the Damselfly ship again in the next part of the adventure. Part 3. Homecoming Ten days after their encounter near the asteroid, the characters return to Toril. Shortly after Sayerth parks the tyrant ship in orbit around Toril, the hammerhead ship, the flighty foundling, arrives to give you, Sayerth and Boswan Tato, a lift back to the academy. Seasoned staff are left behind to take care of the tyrant ship. After returning to Spelljammer Academy on the island of Nimbrel, Tato tells you to get some rest while she and Sayerth brief the senior staff. Tato orders you to stay away from Mikan and report for maintenance work in the morning. The characters aren't allowed to attend the senior staff briefing or see Mikan, who is confined to his quarters. Two veterans stand guard outside Mikan's room, the door to which has an arcane lock spell cast on it. Extraction Force When the characters report for duty the next morning, they're assigned to maintenance work on the flighty foundling. Scrubbing decks and making minor repairs, the flighty foundling is moored to the side of the Spelljammer Academy structure, about 400 feet above the sea dock, roughly at the level of the gymnasium. The character's work is interrupted by a strike force that is determined to retrieve Mikan and commandeer the flighty foundling. Fight for the foundling. Describe the following. As you're deep in your tasks, a shadow of another ship passes over the deck of the flighty foundling. The ship looks like it's preparing to dock on the level directly above you. The ship looks like a giant metal insect, its hull gleaming in the sunlight. Ropes drop from the vessel and land on the main deck of the flighty foundling, near the stern castle. Two brawny hippo-headed humanoids, dressed for combat, zip down the lines on steel loops. They land on deck with a resounding thud. One of them points at you, snorts, and says, Get off our ship! As soon as the jiff lands on the flighty foundling, the damselfly ship swings around to the other side of the academy's tower, heading to make a second deposit the team to extract Mikan. The damselfly ship then departs. Creatures. The two GIF shipmates have orders to secure the flighty foundling, while an extraction team retrieves Mikan, dead or alive. The GIF give the characters a chance to flee the vessel. If the characters stand their ground, the GIF hurl grenades at them before closing into melee range. If captured and interrogated, the GIF reveal that they take their orders from Mustaf Schultz, the Jif captain of the Damselfly ship, who takes his orders from Bokath the Mercane. Schultz and his fellow Jif are mercenaries, and Bokath pays them well for their loyalty. Hammerhead Ship For this encounter, use the Hammerhead Ship deck map. Bosan Tato and the characters are on the forecastle when the Gif land on the main deck near the stern castle. Shipboard Weapons the baluster on the forecastle takes one action to load, one action to aim, and one action to fire. A ballista bolt with plus 6 to hit deals 16 or 3d10 piercing damage on a hit. The hammerhead ship mangonels are undergoing maintenance and have no ammunition available. Shoved overboard, a creature that is pushed over the edge of the ship must make a DC 10 dexterity saving throw to grab hold of the side of the ship. On a failure, the creature plunges down to the water 400 feet below, taking 70 or 20 d6 bludgeoning damage. Another attack? Right as their fight with the GIF concludes, the characters hear an explosion coming from the other side of the academy, in the direction of the cadet quarters. They now have a choice. Head towards what is clearly another attack, continue with freeing Mikan, or remain aboard the flighty foundling and skip ahead to staying put. Freeing Mikan. If the characters leave the ship and race towards the cadet quarters, they hear sounds of musket fire as they get closer to Mikan's quarters. They soon come upon the extraction crew. You reach the bottom of the stairs and see a corridor filled with smoke. 
A half dozen dead bodies litter the hallway floor. Coming towards you, obscured by smoke, are two gaunt figures in armor. One clutches a great sword, while the others holds a struggling, badly wounded Mikan Havistance. Hallway Features The hallway in the cadet quarters is 10 feet wide and 60 feet to the bend at the south. The bodies on the floor belong to two dead sailors, two dead guards, and two dead members of the extraction force, one Jif and one Githyanki. Two rooms lie east of the characters, a laundry room about 20 feet from the stairs, and another dormitory 20 feet beyond that. The hallway has the following features. Errant Grenade One of the dead GIF's grenades was primed but not released when the GIF died at the bend in the corridor. At the end of each turn in combat, roll a d6. On a 6, the grenade rolls from the GIF's hand and goes off. Each creature within a 20-foot radius area of the bend in the south end of the corridor must make a DC-17 dexterity saving throw, taking 17 or 5d6 force damage on a failed save, or half as much damage on a successful one. Light. This area is brightly lit by continual flame spells cast on wall sconces. Smoke. The smoke is from a smoke bomb, dropped by the GIF when the extraction force moved to break Mikan out of his makeshift brig. The smoke makes the hallway lightly obscured. Creatures. Two wounded Githyanki warriors, each with 30 hit points remaining, have Mikan, an apprentice wizard with two hit points remaining, and at-will spells only, in custody. The Githyanki are heading towards the flighty foundling, when the characters intercept them. The Githyanki don't bother to engage in dialogue. One of them grapples Mikan while the other one attacks. If one Githyanki falls in battle, the other Githyanki uses its next action to try to slay Mikan and take his head. One hit is enough to drop Mikan to zero hit points, and a follow-up swing with the greatsword is enough to decapitate him. If the characters defeat the Githyanki before Mikan can be killed, Mikan crumples to the ground and weeps like a baby. He neither helps nor harms the characters. Never fear, Wizpop is here. If the characters are in danger of being defeated by the Githyanki, help comes from an unlikely source. The dormitory near the laundry room is the new temporary quarters for Wizpop, the order gnome rescued by the characters in the previous adventure. Wizpop has been hiding in his room ever since the fighting broke out. Once he spies the characters, he gets the courage to make his presence known to them. From a room nearby, a tinny voice quietly says, Over here, I can help. Wizpop is a non-combatant, but has found his courage and wants to help this dire situation. The characters might have him go get additional help or cause a distraction. If he goes to find help, a few rounds later, he returns with two guards, using the veteran stat block to aid in the fight. Staying put. If the characters choose to remain aboard the flighty foundling, the two wounded survivors of Vokath's extraction force come to them with Mikan in tow. Two gaunt figures in blood-splattered armor emerge from the academy onto the platform where your ship is moored. One clutched a greatsword, while the other holds a struggling, badly wounded Mikan Havistance. Creatures. The two Githyanki warriors, each with 30 hit points remaining, have Mikan, an apprentice wizard with two hit points remaining and at-will spells only, in custody. One of them grapples Mikan while the other uses Misty Step to board the ship and attack. If one Githyanki falls in battle, the other Githyanki uses its next action to try to slay Mikan and take his head. One hit is enough to drop Mikan to zero hit points, and a follow-up swing with a greatsword is enough to decapitate him. If the characters defeat the Githyanki before Mikan can be killed, Mikan crumples to the ground and weeps like a baby. He neither helps nor harms the characters. If the Githyanki defeat or drive off the characters, one of them begins the process of attuning to the Spelljammer Helm. The Githyanki doesn't finish the process. Mert shows up with some aids to defeat the Githyanki force before too long. If one or more characters are dying, Mert shows up in time for those characters to be saved by his aids. After the attack. The following sections tie up a few loose ends. Strained Sigils. Characters who defeat the Githyanki and examine them closely notice a strange sigiled tattoo 
on the back of each Githyanki's right hand. A detect magic spell reveals an aura of transmutation magic around the tattoo. The tattoo is Vokath's sigil, worn by those who are closest to the McCain. If the tattoos are brought to the attention of either Saoth or Tato, they mention it to Mert a few hours later. Mert knows exactly what the symbols mean, and eventually the characters are told as well. It is the mark of Vokath's personal retinue. Only the McCain's most trusted operatives earn it. Mikan's fate. If he survives the attack, Mikan is sentenced to five years of hard labor to be served at a penal colony on a small island off the Sword Coast. He plans to turn over a new leaf and hopes to see the characters again once he's a free man. Damselfly's escape. After dropping off the extraction force, the Damselfly ship is chased away by another spell jamming vessel. The pursuing vessel, which is crewed by the Academy cadets on a training exercise, is slower than the fleeing Damselfly ship. At your discretion, the Damselfly ship might reappear in some later adventure. With Mustaf Schultz in command and the Githyanki Nalvor at the helm. Graduation Day Two weeks after the attack, Graduation Day finally arrives. During the graduation ceremony, each character is brought forward and recognized for their deeds with great fanfare. Towards the end of the ceremony, Mert closes out with a few words memorializing those who were recently lost and promises to keep the Spelljammer Academy open and safe. Each character can choose to remain at the Spelljammer Academy as a newly minted sailor in the ranks of the Spelljammers or the Spelljammer Corps. Conversely, the characters can enroll in a placement program whereby they are assigned to a ship under the command of a captain who is friendly towards Mert and the Spelljammer Academy. The characters are then dispatched to a coastal city and told to await the ship's arrival. Graduation Gifts As a reward for their heroism, each character can choose one item from the following list as a graduation gift. A plus one rod of the Pack Keeper, a plus one shield, a plus one weapon, a bag of holding, goggles of the night. The end? Your time at Spelljammer Academy is over. The promise of a new adventure awaits in Neverwinter, a city to the north. Bosun Tato gnaws at her cigar as she bids you farewell. Don't forget to write, she says with a grin. Far above you, in the space above Coral, a moth-like ship appears, its purpose unknown. It waits, biding its time. Character Advancement The characters advance to fifth level and are ready for the soon-to-be-released adventure in Spelljammer Adventures in Space, where they can continue the adventure in Light of Zarazus.